good evening and welcome back. Uh, welcome again. We're reconvening and uh, continuing with our program. I would uh, please allow me to uh, to give a warm welcome to our next uh, panelist, Mr. Alan Chevalier Geras. I hope I got it correctly. He's a renowned French journalist and writer. He has worked in Afghanistan and the Balkans, expert on political Islam and jihadist movements, has a number of publications in this field, including a, a, a book that will be of high relevance, especially to our people in Sudan. Uh, it's a based on challenging interviews he has conducted with uh, the late Hassan al turabi the Sudanese infamous uh, Islamist. Uh, please uh, welcome Mr. Alan Shibani. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation to share with you my modest knowledge on the organization of the Muslim Brothers, Ikhwan al Muslimun. Sorry for the low quality of my English, but please forgive me accordingly the fact it's not my mother language. As a journalist, I base my understanding of the Muslim Brothers and the fundamentalist movements they influence on different experiences, including my travels in Afghanistan in the 80s on the side of the resistance against the Soviet occupation, challenging interviews with the Sudanese Hassan al Turabi. Public, uh, I published a book of it, and numerous meetings in Asia, Africa, and Europe with Muslim brothers and Islamic fundamentalist leaders. During my intervention, I want to show you that the Muslim brothers, since their creation in 1928, are not only a so-called religious organization, not even only a political one, but also a military structure. First of all, you have to understand that their ideology has, among others, two predominant characteristics. One, their believing is based on an interpretation of Islam and is not Islam itself. Two, as well, if they don't admit publicly Violence and force are the main means they use to take the power or to keep it. The way the Muslim brothers understand Islam is not Islam. In their profession of faith, written by the creator Hassan al banna we read, the banner of Islam has to cover all the human gender. Every Muslim has the mission to educate the world according to the principles of Islam. In the verse I'm talking now, I finished the court. Hassan al -Bana. In the verse 48 of the Surah 5, what they call also a chapter in English, of the Quran, I read after the text was evoking Christians and Jewish. I call the Quran in a translation. For each of you, that's mean the human being, we have a sign a law, and a method. Had God willed, he could have made a single nation of you. I remember, I remember you, according to Islamic faith, in the Quran, God, 
talks to the prophet Muhammad through angel Gabriel, Gabriel for the Christians. The contradiction is very clear between the Quran and Muslim Brothers ideology. Technically speaking, we can say the Muslim Brothers have done what we call in Arabic ishtihad. But if it is the case, according to my personal judgment, um, as well as a non-Muslim, I have got this right. This ishtihad is wrong because in contradiction with the deep mind of Islam. Following the basic principles of humanity, if the Muslim brothers have the right to believe what they want, they don't have the right to impose their belief. And and the way to live and their way to live to the other uh, to the, uh, by force. I repeat, they don't have the right to impose their belief and their way to live to others by force. And it's a characteristic number two of their ideology. They use the use of violence and force to take and keep the power. Again, in the profession of faith, Muslim brothers swear, I quote, to accomplish the jihad in the name of God. May I remind you, the jihad is not one of the five pillars of Islam. That means it's not an obligation in Islam. <coughs> Worse, for the Muslim brothers, the Merched al Ham, the guide, general guide, can declare alone a jihad at the time. In Islam, you need an agreement, a fatwa, told by the ulema to open jihad. <coughs> Other words, permitting to an individual, autonominated leader of a congregation, to start jihad, to call for jihad, may I say, the Muslim brothers appear in total contradiction with the Sharia itself. Even more, Muslim can start jihad only if the Islamic religion is in danger. In case of aggression coming from non-Muslims, If it's not the case, and if the Muslim go to war to conquer land, we talk about a regular war, what you call in Arabic, hat. On that aspect, recent history is precious. In Algeria, between the two world wars, the local ulema refused to declare jihad against the French authority. So in Algeria, between the two world wars, the local ulema refused to declare jihad against the French authority because the French government and the French people didn't attack or offense Islam as a religion. And you can check down. On the other way, during the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan in the 80s, most of the ulema of the country, but also in Asia, 
supported the jihad because communism was there to eradicate Islam. And it's the difference with Algeria. All that to say how far are the Muslim brothers of Islam when they dare to suggest to use Islam as a justification of violence. And it's not only a theory I'm talking about. The Muslim brothers are also physically related with violence. Hassan al-Banna created a movement of scouts, young men trained for war. In 1936, 1936 he sent them to fight in Palestine, Palestine in the name of the Muslim Brothers. During the Arab insurrection, again, in 1949-48, he ordered them to join the first Arab war against Israel. Of course, I am not talking about the reasons of the war against Israel. It's another subject. I want only to make evidence of the relation of the Muslim brothers with military activities since the start of their existence. But there was, in that time, inside the structure of the Muslim Brothers, something much more worrying. They created the so-called secret organization. It's an armed group in charge of the clandestine activities of the Muslim Brothers and train for military action. Saleh Hashmawi was in charge of it. In 1940, Hashmawi <coughs> created open a link with officers of the Egyptian army who we will fa we found in 1950 the free officers movement and the leadership of Gamal Abdel Nasser. Anwar al Sadat, in that time an officer in the army, yet associated to Nasser, delivered weapons to Ashmawi and his group. It's history. Then was starting terrorist activities of the Muslim Brothers. In March 1948, the Egyptian authority ordered to the Muslim Brothers to give back their weapons and to integrate their armed force inside the regular army. Many of the Muslim brothers refused to give back their weapons and to join the army, and they rebelled against the power. Then, in spring, as an answer, in spring 1948, a young man, a member of the Muslim brother, killed a judge in the street. In November of the same year, the two British officers were lynched and killed during the demonstration of the Brotherhood. Three weeks later, a student coming from the ranks of the Muslim Brothers killed the Prime Minister Mahmoud and Nukrashi Pasha. Every time after a terrorist 
aggression. Hassan and Benna affirmed he was not involved. We can suspect him to play a double game. We can also imagine he lost control and few elements were acting on their own. It's interesting to consider that many times in the narrative of Muslim brothers appears the same question. Are they complice or are they or did they lose the control? In other words, are they associated or not to crimes committed by people coming from their own organization. In other words, are Muslim brothers cynical or the ideology they teach is mastering the mind of the recruits to the point a certain, certain number of their followers turn terrorist. I don't have the answer. But in any case, we understand the Muslim brothers are dangerous for the other Muslims and for the human community. <coughs> but they are not dangerous only through their own organization. <coughs> After one century of existence, they dominate most of the Islamic fundamentalist ideologies. I didn't say they dominate the groups. I say they dominate the ideology of all the groups, of all the fundamentalist groups. Different. There is their footprint in the Turkish Rifa Partisi, ancestor of the AKP of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. There is there inside the Esbutarir Liberation Party created in Jordan <coughs> or in the Jamaat Islami created in Pakistan by Saeed Abul Alam al -Dudi. Even in the, Af in the Afghan SB Islami of Gulbuddin Ekmatyar. With every time outbidding in fanatism, you find most of ideas and principles of the Muslim brothers in the precept of groups like Al Qaeda and Daesh. Worse, many Muslims and non-Muslims are convinced the Muslim brother ideology is pure Islam. And I told you it's not the case. Also, many Muslims think they are not good believers because they don't follow Hassan and Bala principles. By opposition, and as a result, many non-Muslims have a bad and a refined vision of Islam. We can say Muslim brothers, their way, prepare knowingly and unknowingly a world conflict which will make the war against Daesh a fox hunting. At that point, anybody will understand how urgent it is to annihilate the Muslim Brothers' ideology. Simple minds will tell you we have only to criminalize this ideology and to jail people supporting their principles.
it has been done in a kit by NASA. After Muslim brothers revolted against him because he didn't share the power with them after giving weapons. In the eyes of people, they looked victims. I mean, the Muslim brothers looked victims. And the new generation turned even more fanatical with Sayyid Qutb because of the bad treatment they were subjected in prisons. Victimization is a strong argument for propaganda, as we know. Others will tell you, you say Muslim brothers are compromised in terrorism. So it's enough to try on them. But even for Hassan al Banna, we saw how difficult it is to prove a supposed relation with violence or terrorism. We have to understand, Muslim brothers are working on two fields. One is propaganda and religious proselytism, what they call in Arabic da'wah. The other, the other one is, the other field is violence. Even if they, there is continuity in their mind between the two fields, I mean violence and dawah, we cannot apply the same behavior when they act as propagandists and when they belong to a terrorist group in action. If against dawah propaganda, we answer using force and prohibition, in Western countries, we will be in opposition with the basic principles of our society about freedom of speech. They will return it against us, telling we are hypocrites and we denig denigrate Islam, what we call Islamophobia. It will be for them another argument to recruit. It's why, on the field of dawah and propaganda, we have, you have, to answer to them with discussions, arguments, and a good knowledge of Islam. Educating Muslims, especially, have to strengthen their understanding of Quran to be able to confront Muslim brothers. I would suggest for Muslims to call it jihad of words for peace and reason, if you like. It's a tough work, but an important one. Because of the pressure of Muslim Brothers' ideology through the world, as we saw. It looks easier to confront Muslim Brothers on the field of violence because of laws. But it's not really the case. One, because of Western weakness on that point. The word terrorist is used sometimes with intention of propaganda on our side by our politicians. So we lose credibility. Two, it is many times difficult to appreciate the difference 
between terrorism and legitimate violence against a tyrannical state. And we face this problem in Syria. Three, actors of certain acts of terrorism can be out of reach for geographical and political reasons. Four, Muslim brothers are very clever and are not new in the business. They know very well how to cover, to compact, to divide activities, to use words with double meanings, abusing Westerners not well trained to face them. I will add one thing. To protect us and the rest of the world against Muslim brothers, Dawah, and other fundamentalist movements preparing in there, we have to be more fair, to work more in direction of justice in the world. Every time we support injustice in the name of our interest or by cowardice, we give the Muslim Brothers argument to denigrate our system, to denigrate our system and enhance their ideology. For sure, we will never be perfect, but I'm talking about wide and irreducible comportments. Five minutes, I'm sorry. Sorry, Sabatui, your branch. Five minutes, please. Sorry? Sorry, if you can squeeze it to five, next five minutes, so please. Okay. Almost done. <laughs> Thank you to have been patient enough no, to no, listen no. to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's one by one, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I hope I brought to you to your attention few points of importance to help you in the next future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Adam Shalom Gilras, uh, for the uh, very illuminating and especially for depicting that vivid painting about the history of the Muslim world. I dare not say that this uh, depicting of the history of the Muslim world has no inference or has no influence on the current status. Uh, thank you for linking history and present as well. Thank you so much. Um, the panelists will take three questions, so if, please make it as heavy as the presentation was. <laughs> Gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, in view of the general public knowledge now that Al-Qaeda was born in Afghanistan, trained and financed by the Saudis, the Saudi at the head of it, that all means that Al-Qaeda was a Wahhabi movement, basically, not a Muslim Brotherhood. So how is it possible, without being in defense of the MB, but how is it possible to claim, as the first speaker said, and you, that MB are the creators of terror fundamentalism in Islam? In fact, the creators of fundamentalism in Islam dates back to 1780, when the Wahhabi movement was created, and all and all fundamentalists today draw their ideology from Ibn Taymiyyah, who's got very little to do with Muslim value. Thank you. Well, it's very easy to answer. In Saudi, in the time uh, Osama bin Laden was at school, there was a lot of teachers in the Saudi schools who were Muslim brothers. And they were not talking, of course, in the name of the Muslim brothers but they were under shelter of the regime of Saudi. It's something to remember. And you have to know, for example, one of the teachers of Osama bin Laden was a Palestinian, and uh, he has been killed in Peshawar 
Abdullah Azam, exactly. He has been killed in, in Peshawar in 1989, and he was on the side of uh, Ben Laden in Pakistan, because at the origin, Ben Laden didn't go straight to Afghanistan, he was staying in, the, in Pakistan in the area of Peshawar and in the tribal area where, is, where the, the, the Pashtuns are located in Pakistan. So it's something very clear. And I didn't say that the, the, the Al-Qaeda was under shelter or under orders of the Muslim Brothers. I told about ideological influence ideological influence. It's very important. And everything in the mind of Ben Laden concerning the declaration of jihad was very much linked to that. Okay? It's something, we cannot mix the things, but we have to be honest. Yeah. Next question, please. Anyone from the back? Thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Allen. I will not make an attempt to read your last name. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Allen, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, just a comment and half a question, perhaps. In the introduction, uh, was, we understand that you wrote a book about Turabi. Uh, I would like to read that book. But uh, just talking about this man, which. Uh, some Western writer, they try to portray him as an intellectual and all of these things. I hope you're not one of them. But anyway, <laughs> the issue of the fatwa. Uh, and, and by the way, he sees himself probably above Hassan al-Banna immediately after the Prophet. But uh, anyway, that's his, <laughs> his own view. But uh, he did issue a fatwa when they created the war in South Sudan encouraging youngsters to go to the war and uh, militarism and all of that. And then the same guy, 10 years later, when he was eliminated from being the godfather of the system, said they were not uh, jihadist or anything, they just died. So I don't know what kind of thinking is this. And then on the issue about the propaganda and violence, uh, I, I fully agree with you. The recent revolution in Sudan against the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, succeeded because they did not use violence, even though they were throwing arms for the youngsters to, to fight them. So uh, you can defeat them by peaceful means, rather than okay. using that. Uh, okay. well, the thing is, you know, I, Thank could, you. I could talk maybe one hour about Hassan and Turani. Uh, the, the, the problem is that we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, first, it wasn't a book on Hassan at Turabi. Okay. It was a book of interviews of Hassan at Turabi. I spent 15 days in Sudan, in, in uh, Khartoum, yeah. to, to make oh. these interviews. Yeah. And it's a big book. It has been published in Lattes. The thing is, uh, it's finished. There is no more books. But maybe you can find now on the internet. And the name is, in French, uh, Islam um, uh, fut, fut, uh, Sorry, I mix up between English and French. So, uh, Say it in French. Say it in French. Islam, I think, Islam Avenir du Monde. Or, uh, or, uh, the, the thing, uh, yeah, yeah uh, the Islam future of the world. Yeah, yeah. You see something like, right. but it's it's not what I think. Oh, it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. I can't say I can't say it's impossible for any religion. Okay, uh, to be clear, it's not only because of it's Islam, but uh, the the thing is, it's a way to think. It was a way to think of uh, Hassan uh, Turabi. You know, so the book, it's his way to think, and not my way to think. Of course, you understand my way to think, because the way of, I ask the questions. Uh, and many times we were in conflict, open conflict. Several times I was afraid, I, I thought he's going to fire me, 
He did not. <laughs> he did not. But what is it, what is interesting, you know, uh, he he uh, sometimes he was open mind. For example, he he was in favor of marriage between Christian and Muslim, which is something not permitted by the Sharia. But the Sharia, I remind you, it's after all an ishtihad. It's not the Quran. It's an ishtihad. We have to keep it in mind. So a Muslim can disobey these days to, uh, the, to the Sharia and obeying to the Quran. It's, it's interesting to notice. Uh, the last question. <laughs> Actually, I have many questions and many comments, but I will summarize all of them in one small question. And I love to get an answer because I'm very confused and very surprised. Can mother, can uh, Muslim brother organization survive without financial support? And if the answer is no, why the international or, um, community can take a decisive action against the supporters and the provider? Well, Until when we carry on talking and making uh, 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 meetings and let what's go going on continue. My country, Egypt, has suffered. And I live here, but I'm also suffering with them. Until thank when thank we you, don't sir. have to watch them. Point taken. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, sir. OK. I, I understand, as an Egyptian, you f your deep feeling. I understand it, especially after what I told. The thing is, our friend, Mikhail, was talking about that. Remember, the Muslim brothers, like many, to create their movement in Israel in 1989 by the Israeli government, who wanted to use them against LPO. It's the truth. You see, it's it's why I say, and I told my way because I didn't want to attack anybody. I, Politics is something very difficult yeah. to speak honestly. And sometimes, you know, you find a short way to do what you want, especially when you are in danger, and you do a mistake. Because on the long term, it's going to be a bloody mistake. Okay? It's why we have to work <laughs> seriously. We have to work in terms to look for justice and not only to find short ways for our politics. And it's true for other world, uh, the rest of the world, but it's true also for Western countries. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Um, <laughs>